Hello and welcome to a topic four, lecture two. And in this lecture, we're going to take a look at the sociological theories of crime. So in this lecture, we're gonna be looking at the sociological theories. And from their perspective, criminals, they view criminals and those who engage in criminal behaviors as a product, that they are a product of society. In other words, that society produces criminals. Um, criminals are not born. Uh, and so maybe engaging in a crime is a choice, a personal, rational choice. Uh, maybe it's a product of biology. But maybe there are social factors that also help us understand and explain criminality. And so the sociological theories focus on the role that society plays in producing criminal behavior. So there are two main sociological branches within criminology, okay? So within the sociological theories, one branch is known as the structural, the social structure theory. And the social structure theory focuses on poverty. And they argue that crime is a byproduct of poverty, that high poverty areas create conditions that produce and support criminality. And so in a, in a moment, we'll dig into that in more detail. The other branch within sociological theory is what is known as social process theories. In that theory, they're basically saying that there are that the root cause of crime cannot be found solely in poverty. In fact, many people are raised in poverty and they do not engage in criminal behavior. So there has to be some other source of explanation. And so for the social process theories, they argue that interpersonal interaction and relationships, so social, the social processes that humans engage in through their interpersonal relationships and the relationships that they have within society, that those can influence behaviors, okay? And that criminality is a product of that socialization, okay? So let's dig into social structure theory first. So within social structure theory, there are three main sort of sub theories, okay? Um, one is social disorganization, the theory of social disorganization. The other is this concept known as the, con the culture of poverty. And then the third is um, the theory of strain, okay? So social disorganization, culture of poverty, strain. Let's look at each of these individually. So one of the social structure theories is known as social disorganization. And basically what this theory says is that crime is a product of a transitional neighborhood that's disorganized and plagued with problems that make areas prime for crime, okay? And so when you say a sort of a transitional neighborhood there, you're off that this theory is referring to the impact that high levels of poverty can have on a neighborhood or a part of a city or a state for that matter. Um, and that because with poverty comes um, disorganization sometimes, not always, but sometimes. And so, you know, sort of look at some of the neighborhoods in Milwaukee. You know, you look at the neighborhoods um, sort of uh, near UWM, near the lake, right? That's a, that's a higher income area. There are big houses, they're well tended to, um, that it, it seems like a very organized and non-transitional neighborhood. People live there for a while, right? You get the sense that that there's not a lot of crime or chaos going on there. But you look at other areas. So I live in River West. You look, you know, uh, sort of west of River West. That's a, that's an area that has a much higher poverty level, right? Um, and uh, that that because of higher poverty level, that, that oftentimes that 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 people don't own their homes. Some do, but not all. You have a higher level of renters. Um, when you're renting, that can be more transitional, right? Because you are not, um, you may not be staying there for a long time. You may not be able to stay there for a long time. Uh, then you have to move to a new place, right? When you're a homeowner, you kind of stay put for a while. Also, when you're renting, that you might not have the the, the money or the ability to improve your property, right? It's not your property. So if the roof is broken or the windows are cracked, um, you know, you, you have to contact your landlord and they have to fix it. And if the landlord is remote or absentee, then things don't get done. And so when you look at a neighborhood that it has a higher poverty level that, you know, it, there is a sense of disorder, of decay and uh, a chaos. And so that 
not only that, but the people who live in the neighborhood can feel as if that um, their neighborhood is sort of disconnected from the more wealthy areas within the city, that they're maybe forgotten, and that there can be a sense of hopelessness or uh, despair that one might get from living in that neighborhood. And so when you feel hopeless, when you feel despair, when you feel sort of forgotten, that might, you know, lend itself to engaging in you know, criminal behaviors, right? Because it's like, hey, what do you have to lose? Okay. Uh, also that you might feel that uh, uh, power, higher poverty areas uh, may, you know, uh, it might be easier to get away with things in those areas because maybe that there's not a lot of patrolling that's going on there, or maybe there is, right? And so that that idea is that a more uh, socially disorganized poor neighborhood opens itself up for criminal activities in a way that um, richer uh, and more affluent uh, neighborhoods do not have the same kinds of social disorganization. Uh, along with this is this um, a culture, and this is kind of a, 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 um, a, a theory that is kind of discredited or looked down on um, because it's basically saying that we live in poverty, that you embrace values that are sort of contrary to the pro-social values, right? But the culture of poverty is that people in lower class create a separate society with separate norms that conflict with mainstream values and norms, right? And so, you know, mainstream values and norms are go to school, get an education, graduate, go to college, get a good paying job, get married, right? Um, and so that, and if you do those things, right, then, um, then you know, your, your life will, you know, you'll, will be better because of that. Well, in a culture of poverty that, um, that you know, you might want to do those things, but you might look around and you might say, look, I don't see a lot of people who are going to school. I don't see a lot of people who are going to school and actually getting good jobs. There's a high level of unemployment in my neighborhood. I, you know, I, I'm poor, so I can't own a car. So it's hard for me to get to my job. Um, and so that you might embrace, um, you know, uh, uh, values that are like, hey, you're, if you go to school and you buy into the so-called American dream and that education is going to change your life, it's kind of a sucker, right? So you might create a different sort of set of values that school is for suckers, that, um, you know, uh, getting a job and, 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 and you know, uh, get, getting paid minimum wage and working your way up the ladder, right? That that's for, you know, it, you know, if you find an endeavor that is criminal that makes you more money, you're a, you're a loser for not going for it, right? And so there's this idea that there's this values um, that come with poverty that can sort of um, support uh, criminal or antisocial behavior. And the third social structure theory is what is known as strain. Uh, what strain is saying is that when people want to adopt the goals of conventional society but lack the means to do that, that that um, results in frustration and that frustration can play itself out in antisocial criminal behavior, okay? So the idea is, is that, um, that, uh, that you very well might want to attend school, right? You very well might want to get a great education and get a diploma from your high school that allows you to do well in college, right? You really might want to uh, have a family, to get married, that you may really want to have a job and hold a job, right? But that because of poor circumstances that you live in, it's very difficult to do that, right? That you live in a, 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 a you know, when it comes to public schools, we fund our public schools through taxpayer dollars, right? And in particular, through property taxes, not solely, but in, in, in part by property taxes. So if you live in a higher, uh, uh, an area that has higher property values, then those schools are going to get uh, higher funding, right? Uh, lower, less funding, right? And so when you're poor, you might go to schools that are underfunded, right? And that you're not maybe going to get the best education, right? And so you want to get an education, but because of the funding or because of the general disorder that might come from the growing up in poverty, right? That, that you're stymied from achieving that goal. You really might want to have a job, but no jobs are available, right? You really might want to get married, but because that there is no job, you might not be seen as sort of like you don't have a job, so you're not seen as like sort of a good fit for marriage, right? What are you bringing to the table? And so you can get really frustrated. You get angry because of that. And then that anger and frustration plays itself out in, in criminal behavior. And so all th three of these sub theories help us understand why um, from the social structure theory that criminality is regarded as a byproduct of poverty. 
and here's a good slide that from your textbook, it's a graph or a, 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 a figure that basically brings to life um, the strain theory, okay? So on the one side here, you see that, that here's the source of strain. Failure to achieve goal, disjunction uh, in terms of expectations and achievement. You want th something, but you're not able to achieve that. Uh, removal of po positive stimuli, people encouraging you to do things, um, and uh, uh, also the presentation of some negative stimuli, right, within your disorganized neighborhood. And then the, that can result in anger, frustration, disappointment, and that that can lead to antisocial behaviors like delinquency, violence, dropping out, um, a drug abuse, all of which are, um, you know, basically uh, comorbidities, really, you know, not, you know, factors that uh, sort of uh, contribute to um, uh, antisocial or criminal behavior, and some of which are criminal behavior. So the other main branch of social, social sociological theories are what are known as the social process theories. Um, remember that social process theories are saying, look, maybe poverty plays a role in, in criminal behavior, but a lot of people grow up in poverty and they are not criminals. So there's gotta be, and also there's people who grow up in affluent areas who are criminals, right? There are lots of examples of that. And so for uh, social process theory, they say that criminality is not necessarily a product of poverty, but it is a product of society. It's a product of socialization. And so there are three theories in social process theories, social learning theory, social control theory, and social reaction theory. So let's take a look at each of these. So the first theory is social learning theory. And this is a broad theory within sociology. Uh, it's basically a theory that says that our behaviors are shaped by the people that we associate with our family and our peers. And so that, you know, families and parents can have a positive impact on your learning, how your social learning, they can teach you, um, you know, uh, behaviors and values that encourage you and reward you for engaging in pro-social behaviors. But you can also learn from your family and uh, peers uh, that uh, behaviors that are, are criminal or antisocial. And so from this perspective, they say that people don't, they're not born criminals, but they're taught to be criminals, right? And that they learn this criminal behavior from the relationships that they have within their family and within the influences that they have for, from their peer group. The more deviant your network is, the deviance, uh, the deviance uh, away from sort of like uh, what would be considered normal pro-social behavior, as you deviate away from that, right, in your family and your peers, the more deviant that your network is, the more prone to antisocial and criminal behavior that you are. Uh, and so if you grow up in a family where people in your family participate in crimes and it's seen as normal and maybe even commendable behavior, you get a message from that when you're a kid being being raised up, that that's appropriate, that you're not going to get punished for engaging in that kind of behavior. And even if you're getting messages from your family that that kind of behavior is wrong, right, you get strong messages from your peer group, right, that your family might say, don't do that. But you, young people spend a lot of probably more time with their peer group than they do with their families oftentimes. And so when you're getting messages from your peer group that it's, you know, like, hey, if you want to be friends with us, you're going to engage in criminal behaviors. This is normal. This is how we, this is how we do. This is how we act. Then that's the message that you're going to get that, the, that, that from your peer group, that when you act in that antisocial criminal way, you're going to get a rewarded from your peer group. So that, that uh, criminal uh, behavior is really something that you are socialized to. Uh, the good news there is that criminal behavior, you can be like, you know, you can unlearn it as well by replacing a deviant network with, um, you know, a, a non-deviant uh, network. Uh, and so that, you know, as I said, adolescents are taught the attitudes of values and behaviors that support that criminality. And that, uh, that, that, that young people model their behavior after the violent and criminal acts of adults, particularly when the violent and criminal acts of adults are seen as being rewarded within that society. Okay. So that is sort of, you know, in summary, uh, the, the, the social learning theory that of the social process, that is a part of the branch of the social process theories. Another theory within the social process theories is the social control theory. I think this is a really interesting theory. 
Um, but basically, they say that everybody has the potential to engage in criminal behavior. Everyone has the potential to not be criminal, right? It's not like we're preordained to act in a certain way, but that our behavior is linked to the bonds that we have within society. And so that when we have these and keep these bonds to society and we have strong bonds with people within society, institutions within society, that those bonds can prevent people from violating social rules and, and, and violating social rules is a good example of that is committing crimes, right? That when you have those strong bonds that um, you follow the social rules uh, and that when you break those bonds, that those social rules are more easily broken and that therefore crimes are can be committed. Let's take a look at the, the illustration that they have in your textbook that brings the social control theory to life. And I think it'll give us a good, a, a deeper and better understanding of this theory. Okay, so here's the illustration in your textbook. And it it's basically saying that there's certain bonds that we have, okay? There are attachments that we make to people. Um, there are commitments that we have to make good on. There are beliefs that we have and can be taught. And there are also in ways in which we are involved, okay? And that when we have strong positive attachments with our friends, with our families, with our community, when we care about our parents, when we feel like our parents care about us, when we really care about our, our friends and we don't want to let them down, we don't want to do something that is criminal or antisocial, um, particularly if the people in your friend group are are not criminal, right? You don't wanna let your friends down. Um, and you, if you feel like your community is looking out for you and that they have your back and they want you to succeed, then you make an attachment to that. Um, that the same with commit, uh, commitments to family, commitment to your career, right? That you have a job that you're, you're gonna show up to. And if you don't show up to that, your boss is gonna ask you where you were, right? Um, you, the commitment that you have to education, right? That you're going to school when you don't show up, your, your mom's wondering where you are, why didn't you show up? That your, your teacher, you've let your teacher down, okay? You can also have a commitment to achieving uh, future goals. Uh, beliefs that um, in fairness and responsibility, uh, even patriotism that you don't, you know, that you, you value the, uh, you know, the core principles of your of your the government in which you reside within honesty and, and involvements being involved in, you know, uh, community events, uh, religious groups, social clubs. Right. And so the idea is that when you when you make good on these, uh, the, when you have strong attachments, when you're involved, when you are taught particular beliefs and you actually value those beliefs when you don't want to let people down that are close to you right then you can you, your your behavior will um, conform in such a way that uh, you know sort of supports these values of the importance of family the importance of having a job but when you don't have these strong bonds when you don't have attachments to your family when you don't really have these kinds of beliefs where maybe you have a nihilism or that nothing matters or you're going to die anyways right um, you know, when you don't have opportunities to get involved, when those bonds are broken, then it's kind of like a, you have like more of a, a who gives a shit sort of attitude about your life and about the life around you and that you're more likely to engage in antisocial criminal behavior. So I think it's an interesting theory because it really um, you know, shows sort of the interaction between the individuals and the bonds that they have within their community and what can happen when those bonds fray. And then the final social process theory is the social reaction or the labeling theory. Um, and again, we'll look at a slide that I think does a good job bringing this theory to life. Um, but this theory is the view that society produces criminals by stigmatizing people, right? By, by labeling them as criminal. In doing that, you actually begin to produce criminal behavior. You produce criminals, okay? So let's go ahead and look at the, the graphic from your textbook that brings this theory to life. Okay, so this graph sort of shows you sort of the steps, and let me put on my magic pen here, you know, starting on this side and then continuing on this side for the, the labeling um, theory. And so, you know, basically here it says that somebody uh, engages in a, an additional criminal, uh, an initial criminal act, okay? And then that, that they get detected by um, the justice system, okay? So it's like you commit a crime, the justice system, uh, detects it. And then at that point that there's this decision to label the indiv individual as criminal. Okay. And so that, uh, it, uh, that 
being labeled a criminal from this theory, it creates this new identity, right? That um, that an individual gets this label of criminal uh, basically feels as if they've been identified as this deviant, as this um, a troublemaker, right? And that, that, that what follows from that label is an acceptance of the label, right? If society is going to label you as criminal, right, then you're going to act like a criminal. And then people start treating you like a criminal, right? That, um, that you accept that, uh, self-labeling, I've been labeled that by society, so I'll basically show, show you. And the, the stigmatized event, uh, offenders, as it says there, are locked in uh, to these sort of criminal careers, right? They're labeled a criminal, they're treated like a criminal, they, in, they adopt that identity of I'm a criminal, and so then they begin acting like a criminal, right? And so that, as you can see here, that, um, you know, with these sociological theor th uh, theories, they really dovetail really nicely into some of the uh, uh, criminal justice perspectives we learned about. You can definitely see the non-interventionist perspective dovetailing really nicely into this, the labeling uh, social theory, right? Uh, but then we can also see the social disorganization and also uh, uh, the culture of poverty, uh, that those can really relate to the sense of rehabilitation, right? That if you want to end uh, criminality, uh, you know, uh, cre uh, invest in areas that are poor so that they are less disorganized and then criminals will not be produced. And so you can basically see that there's nice dovetailing into some of these theories that we've learned about uh, earlier this semester. So in conclusion, I want to draw your attention to this really great documentary called The Interrupters. Um, and it is a documentary that was produced in 2010 by the documentary filmmaker Steve James. Um, it's a really cool story. It tells the story of three violence interrupters. That's why it's called The Interrupters of three violence interrupters in Chicago who basically um, they're former gang members and then they come back into they leave the criminal lifestyle and then they come back and then they try to violence interrupt they try to interrupt violence before it takes place in 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 the sh in, in in Chicago on the south side it is a great documentary for many reasons, but it really does a great job of illustrating the social structure and the social process theories um, that you've learned about in this lecture and we will continue learning about in the textbook. Th this is you know, optional. I just wanted to let you know it. There is a link to watching the documentary if you'd like to watch it in topic four module. So thank you for listening. I always appreciate your time and attention and I'll talk to you again soon.